These four gentlemen will uh, stay on stage because now we're going to do a sort of a wrap-up of the day until now. And Karl Heinz is going to be the moderator, so I would like to invite him back to stage. And uh, as you can see, we have space for some more people. So I would uh, like to ask Peter Gensch to come back. I would like to ask Brian Solis to come back and Scott Galloway. He should also be here for a limited conversation which should have been 60 minutes now is down to 40 and then we're back on track thank you very much gentlemen for returning and for being part of the q and a session take it away thank you connie uh, we are always good for time saving yeah so maybe we can save even 30 more minutes or so uh, to make it attractive to anything so that we get closer to the party tonight. Yeah? I hope that you all registered. Who registered, by the way, for the party already? Ah, uh, <laughs> looks not too promising. You should not take miss this thing. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, thanks for inspiring uh, and interesting, uh, inspiring and uh, interesting uh, presentation so far. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as I did today. Um, I would like to start with uh, uh, Michael. Um, um, Michael, you spoke about Dell and the, the whole evolution. I know that your background was in online sales. So yeah, that you did computer and uh, printer sales. And then you came to the social media stuff like the mum to the child, yeah, so it was not completely <laughs> done. Uh, uh, tell me, what was your first experience when you, when you spoke first with Michael Dell about this and, and uh, you built up this control centers, the command centers? Um, I, I think the, the main, for me, the main personal thing was curiosity. I mean, I, I looked at Michael Dell, how he's just curious about this. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, when Google Plus launched, I mean, he, he did hangouts with, you know, totally strange people, you know, in the middle of the night. And, you know, the thing is that he didn't do this just for fun. He called me and said, like, Michael, that's a great sales tool for complex solutions because we have people on the phone. You don't have visibility. You can actually work that way. So immediately make the transition between that is a commercial tool you can use, but it's actually something which, you know, lets you connect with customers. And it's always this pragmatism. At the same time, you have the motivation to learn. And like I said, I would say most of the Dell people would say, we are pioneers, we are early. I mean, we still have no clue where this goes. I mean, we put down so much money to train 15,000 people. I, I cannot tell you exactly you know, where this goes, and I, can tell, I cannot tell you the ROI today, but I know the ROI is something which will definitely show, and that keeps me motivated because I think there's something really, really big happening in this change process. Actually, uh, Michael told me some, some weeks ago a story that Michael Dell was saying, look, I was always in the business of one-to-one, -one, and now social media gives me really the potential, or is helping me, to, to get to the full potential of one-to-one -one marketing, really. That's what you yeah. said. Peter, Peter Gensch, uh, you are a specialist in social media monitoring, so you have a lot of clients. I think a lot of your clients are here today uh, um, from the analytics side, integration into the systems. Uh, why, do you, why did you enter this space? And also, what is your experience, especially now when it comes to social media monitoring? So what you said as a listening part. Uh, and why do you feel that this is so important? Well, I'm an analytical guy, so I was always interested in getting insights out of data. Um, but to be honest, I think we're a little bit on the optimistic side talking about social media monitoring because it's not that easy. I will give you just a simple example. It might be, sound a little boring. If you would like to measure and manage the brand Apple, to be honest, it's not easy because it's about semantic. If you just type in Google, you will get so much noise. Mm -hmm. So, and in the beginning you have, for example, you, you have to find a search term. And if it's too wide, then you run the risk to get so much noise. And if it's too tight, you run the risk to miss out opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, I think it's not that easy on Slideware. It's e always easy just mm -hmm. to plug in. You have the social media and they have the data warehouse. Mm -hmm. But I think much effort is to, required to do that in a good way. Mm -hmm. And we really need reliable data. Mm -hmm. And that's... I have some concern about that because we are looking all at these fancy dashboards and they have these diagrams coming up, but we have to look beyond the data. And look at cloud score, that's ridiculous. So it's some kind of magic. It doesn't work. And if we really want to like to derive actions, if we want to set up our business strategy based on social media, we need to get reliable data. 
And the same tonality, we all are talking about sentiment analysis. It's that hard job to do that because you have all the irony and it's so hard to read between the lines. So I'm a business intelligence fan and expert, and my passion is to apply the business intelligence technique to the social media field. And there's a lot of work to do. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a huge potential to use social media as a data source, but it's a lot of effort has to be done. And I think we have a lack of experience and practice how to ensure data quality out there in the social media sphere. There's so much noise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks, Peter. Brian, I'm looking to you. You are as an uh, analyst uh, who is covering the whole world, so you are going back and forth between Asia, the United States, and also Europe. Well, how do you feel about what Peter just said regarding the data and the value which is in it? And what is your experience from the customer side? You talk a lot to the executives on a global, uh, in global companies. Okay, how much time do we have for that? that I'm still reveling in, in shitstorm management. And I think the reality is that what Peter's talking about is less about big data and more about trying to put social media in boxes that we know. Sentiment, share of voice, and what he's, tr what he's trying to get businesses to see is how to leverage this information to be more engaging to a variety of different customers. This is something that's completely foreign to organizations because as segmentation goes, it really was about demographics. Mm -hmm. So now we're trying to look at how to package or repackage this information in ways that it's going to mean something to be more engaging to real human beings, but we don't have the processes internally to take that information, interpret it, and reinterpret it within the company. What I see companies or executives dealing with or struggling with today is you have executives who say this is what our business objectives are, and then you have social media strategists that say this is what our social media strategy is, and they're divergent. They're not on the same path whatsoever, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So big data, interpreting information and making it into, well, translating it into intelligence and actionable insights is really how we start to bring this together. So what I see in terms of what the next steps should be is to stop thinking about activity, stop worrying so much about the, the three Fs, as I call them, friends, fans, and followers, stop worrying about tonality, and really start trying to drive the engagement that you expect to see that you can measure success against. So it's, it's like that old saying, start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind. What is your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish so that your strategies trigger the types of activities that your listening mechanism can start to track so that you're not just listening to conversations in social media like everybody else is doing. You're now starting to get insight to have a competitive edge so that you can be more engaging and relevant to your audience. So it's as best as I could distill it, but we could talk about that for hours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Ulf. A uh, hotel reservation system, a company who is in the business online selling uh, hotel uh, uh, nights, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, why does your company feel that social media is so interesting or even uh, important for your company? Because uh, if you look at the customers um, and the life cycle the customers make before they book, mm -hmm. it's like they, they get inspired by content, maybe a destination or something, mm -hmm. and then they have their decision. I want to go there, I want to do that, and then they plan their trip. Mm -hmm. And this pre-travel process, we can, we can, uh, we can optimal uh, um, provide content for our customers to, um, yeah, to bind them and to get them in the process of looking for hotels at our platform. Mm -hmm. So that's the pre-travel travel process. And the post-travel process, I've made the booking and then I make the trip and I have to share what I experienced, mm -hmm. is another thing we can use social media for to, to inspire another customers. And then you have the cycle because the people who share experience and mark with HRS, they, uh, the people got their insights, their reviews, and come back to the, to, the, to the process again. So that's for us really, really relevant. Okay. Thank you. And this is something I, I would refer to Scott when I saw your speech today. Uh, you said, what makes you become 100 years old? Uh, the last point was 
because we are social or social is so important to us. Uh, for business, it looks that social is coming important as well. Yeah, so uh, what are your observations? You have uh, spoken briefly about Burberry today and so, uh, some other brands. Uh, how do you feel is the, the gene inside of the organization in these large organizations, how easy to transfer it into a social environment? Because some of these customers, I, have, I know it from my discussions with a lot of clients, they are, let's say, it's not easy always to get the right ear inside of the organizations. How do you feel about that? So, first off, organizations are messy because they're made up of people, and people are messy. And the majority of consumer companies were built or reverse engineered from the greatest economic force in the history of mankind, and that was the baby boomer, right? So we had this incredibly prosperous, promiscuous spending generation of baby boomers. And the majority of CPG growth, or consumer packaged goods and consumer growth, has been focused on this baby boomer. And we did it by reinforcing core associations with the brand through great intangible imagery and stuffing the channel with our product and hoping that intangible imagery presented well at the distribution chain resulted in an above market margin. Now we're catering to a Gen Y consumer that consumes media differently, uh, values authenticity, still loves brands. But our, the, the method to get to this person is entirely different. And the majority of people running companies were successful catering to a baby boomer. So it's like you're a fantastic footballer or a fantastic pitcher, and then show, someone shows up and says the game has changed. And it's scary, right? I, I look around my colleagues at, at NYU, and I realized about two years ago, I used to make fun of all these guys in their 50s and 60s who were great in 1980, <laughs> and now we all just mock them because they walk around giving the same speech over and over again. And I realized I was turning into that guy because at the age of 44, I, I realized that all the stuff around brand and Nike and intangible associations, we've moved from an era of the intangible to the tangible. You have an amazing product. I was a brand strategist. I made a lot of money telling people to spend more money on the intangible associations and marketing. <laughs> now, if you have an amazing product, word can spread faster than it ever has. This is the era of the tangible. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, are my skill set, the way I'm organizing my company, the, the investments I'm making personally, are they around catering to a baby boomer consum consumer with a CPG marketing uh, attitude, or am I truly engaging this new type of marketing? What we also see is women do a better job. Women, and I'm not saying that to be politically correct. I know what it is. Why? Because women are more talented. It's because they are more engaged in their kids' lives. Talk to a male CEO about what his kids do, and he'll say, oh, he's on the iPad all the time. Ask a female CEO what her kids do. She'll tell you what apps they're on, what shopping sites they're on, how many friends they have. Angela Aarons at Burberry gets it. So they've made, more, <clears throat> they've made more investments in digital than their male counterparts who, quite frankly, are asking their assistants to print out their emails, right? Mm -hmm. So it's humans. There's no easy answer. But we all have to look in the mirror and say, are we comfortable changing the way we strike the ball? Because it's difficult. It's difficult at this age to, to, to learn new tricks. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, interesting insight. Um, so we have spoken about different things, different industries, computer, hotel reservations, uh, and hotel booking systems. Peter, Ami, uh, you know, I was kind of mid early involved in the whole idea, and uh, maybe some people find it odd to say, okay, Facebook is the next recruiting platform. Uh, what made you uh, feeling that this is the right thing, and especially uh, what what, what um, made you believe that we can execute this uh, uh, in a way that it is successful for both, for the client, so the, the final, the employee, and it is, uh, hopefully sooner or later, uh, and for the army as well? Okay, sure. Um, fortunately, it's not just me on my own um, <laughs> that, that, that believed in this. It's been uh, something we've worked through for some time. Um, I would say um, this is not the first thing uh, we're, we've done in... Facebook particularly, um, we've obviously tested and done smaller things over time in Facebook focusing on this. So we've already proven, I think some of my examples mentioned that, we've already proven by just a small nudge uh, in advertising to focus attention towards a Facebook environment and away from a, a more mainstream traditional road is already delivered on those results. Um, 
our focus is with, with everything we're doing with our customers in general, actually, is to, is to try and focus on the app, something specific. You know, trying to, trying to bite off the whole world of social media, that's kind of tough um, uh, in, in one day, uh, at least. Um, so we try and do everything by focusing on a particular goal. Um, I could give an, uh, different examples, like in Transport for London, where actually we're focusing very specifically on taxi drivers as a, as a first specific application to bring them into a very specific rationale. Um, but yeah, bringing it back to recruitment in that sense, and why recruitment should work, to a degree our audience has, had already spoken. Mm -hmm. um, people are certainly of the primary demographic we were looking at, although it does go broader than that, fortunately, um, had already chosen to engage with the army in Facebook. So they already have a significant team who are, in effect, your equivalent like a call centre team, mm -hmm. but they are former officers talking and engaging with people, bringing their questions, bringing their recruitment questions to people and getting direct answers in that channel. So mm -hmm. it's been a natural evolution. So fortunately, I've got a kind of body of proof behind me before we okay. reach this point. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, uh, for Telco Carrier, uh, when I was speaking uh, in the morning, I spoke, data is changing everything. Why do you think that this is so important in marketing? And, and do you think that we are on the tip of the iceberg or do you think that we already have some breakthrough data where we say, look, this is the holy grail in marketing. This is how we can make use, best use out of for us and for our customers because I always think that we have to think in both directions. Uh, it's the user experience, the customer experience, and of course it's that we can do our jobs better. I don't think that we are on the tip of the iceberg, as it was mentioned before. Um, this is not the airplane industry. We are in, in a transforming industry, a really fast transforming industry. Um, and also what I mentioned, um, right now you can, can see in Facebook, for example, um, what do you like uh, in the next month you will um, see what do I want to have what did I bought so mm -hmm. we we will get specific data from the users and I think the whole social data um, that we are gathering will be the basis of social commerce I don't say that uh, social commerce is something like you put your standard web shop into Facebook and now you are Facebook commerce mm -hmm. it is so um, as a, it is selling through Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, this can also be um, you identify influencers mm -hmm. and give them special special um, products that you wanted to sell them. For example, if you knew I'm an Ajax Amsterdam fan here, mm -hmm. you don't have to offer me some fine Rotterdam ticket. But if you um, offer me a, a uh, the new jersey for the ne next season and, mm -hmm. and the card against Fein Rot Rotterdam here in the stadium, I will, glad, uh, will be glad to, to buy it. So we, we have to, to see the data and uh, make something out of it. Yeah. Okay, so I've asked several questions, but maybe there are some questions in the audience where you say you would like to ask one of the uh, famous guys here on stage. Yeah. Uh, do we have a mic here? Okay. Yes, yes. Peter. <laughs> so, do we have questions in the auditorium? I'm very fast coming to you. Uh, and also this, tell us who, this young, who you would like to This young gentleman ask. will share his name and uh, the organization yeah. he works for with us before he puts yeah. his question I'm, to us. I'm Robert. I work for Payback in Germany. Um, and my question is, um, do you have best practice examples for social commerce? Um, what's your, like, what would be the best practice examples? Who would you like to ask? Or sure. we get just in the if audience? someone has a like, good idea and best practice examples because we are... Uh, taken to look at social gaming and social commerce and yeah comparison. Well, I'll start with one best practice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Fine. That is to know what you're trying to accomplish in terms of social commerce. Uh, there are many. There are multiple stages of it, right? There's uh, awareness and consideration. There's influence. There's the actual transaction itself, and then there's the process of service and advocacy. Uh, Scott brought up a real interesting point earlier today where he said that most of the businesses who, for example, experimented with F-commerce or Facebook commerce failed. 
And the reason why I bring this up, because even though it's one sliver of social commerce, is because it was designed to fail. People took old school commerce principles and applied it to Facebook, sticking an entire store catalog as an app within a Facebook tab. And of course it was des destined to fail because that wasn't the right experience. The right experience, if you looked at, for example, how Walmart approached a television special. I mean, I appreciated it because, number one, it was a, a nice television for a great price. But the gimmick was if, they, if it got 5,000 likes, the deal would unlock. So very much like Groupon. If the average person is connected to 150 people on Facebook and you multiply that by 5,000 likes, you increase the potential amount of impressions. So not only did you increase visibility for the brand, but you sold at least 5,000 televisions. It had purpose and everybody was waiting for the next day's deal and then the next day's deal. So I, I like the idea of social commerce from a best practice of having an intention in mind and knowing what success looks like before it's over and having it focus on what that experience is going to be like. Creating an entire store and hoping that it's going to go social is, is I don't just see that happening because people aren't in social networks to shop per se, but they are influenced in the yeah. moment to do something. So what is that something and def define it? Thanks, thanks, Brian. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure, Scott, if you were involved, but I heard uh, two months ago a story from Burberry's mm -hmm. where they introduced a new fragrance mm -hmm. just on Facebook. Uh, are you familiar with the campaign and with the success? Yeah, for the, bo for the body. Uh, yeah, launch absolutely. The body yeah. So, Maybe we could and then I want to come back to best practices. But the thing we need to remember is great marketing doesn't li does not live in isolation of anyone media. The best increase in Facebook likes and followers tend to be with programs. I'll give you an example, CoverGirl. We track the Facebook likes of 4,400 brands. All of a sudden, we saw CoverGirl spiking. Now, they were doing great sampling. Sampling is a great strategy, great best practice online if you have a physical product and you can parse a bit of it. It's a great way to attract a ton of likes. They also supported it with a TV campaign, supported by a print campaign, supported by a celebrity, supported by CPC advertising on Facebook. By the way, what is this notion that social media should be free? That's one of the things I don't get with CEOs. They, they think if they just allow you to be open to it, that, 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 but they don't want to spend money, right? It, you have to spend money in this medium. But the integrated programs work really well. Facebook launched uh, Body, which is now the seventh biggest fragrance in the U.S., off the back of its, of its 12 million strong Burberry. black community. Excuse me, Burberry. Back to best practices a lot around social commerce. A lot of it is the heuristic. I would argue best practices in social commerce, Amazon. They, it, seems, it seems rote now, but they were the first ones to have user reviews. Best practices in social commerce, iTunes. Can you imagine when, when I was a kid, go, I used to go to the record store. Can you imagine going into a record store, I had the actual physical album, and then looking in the back and would say, this song's great, this one sucks, don't buy it. That's how I shop for music now, based on your reviews. That's social. Amazon is not a warehouse attached to a search engine. It's social commerce, as is iTunes. The only, so, the only thing I would add to that, though, and, mm -hmm. and this is where it gets interesting, especially in the segmentation of consumerism, is that the connected consumers demonstrated that there is no value in generic reviews. That they can't, they can't, if they don't know who you are and if you don't share similar interests, mm -hmm. They have to read through review after review after review until they find something that really sings to them. I know personally that's how I look at reviews. Mm -hmm. And so Amazon recently started to experiment with social recommendations. Um, other, other services are doing this as well. For, for example, Google, where you only see the reviews or experiences of your social graph. And if you think about it in that regard, another best practice for social commerce is to think less about the social graph and more about the interest graph. Mm -hmm. So how are people connected based on interests and what is it that they appreciate and how is it that they take action? And I did this research uh, for Starbucks. They didn't ask me to, but I did because it's all public data. And it was very interesting to look at what the social graph of people who are connected to Starbucks appreciate versus the interest graph of what people share amongst each other. Mm -hmm. And if I had to design a marketing campaign around one or the other, it would have been the interest graph is far more targeted. Uh, yeah. A lot of that, too, depends on price point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. I will buy a 99-cent song based on the wisdom of a crowd, even not knowing that I don't know the crowd that well. Where is that hotel I'm staying in here? Yeah. I went on to TripAdvisor, yeah. and I wanted to get a sense for who was actually reviewing the hotel to make sure that our, right. to your point, interest graphs overlapped.
Yeah. So w w which it, uh, what shows again how important it is to get rid of the silos because I think that is today the way uh, Still, if we think about the organizational impact, Michael, you spoke about this, uh, that a, a visionary like Michael Dell said, okay, this is an important part for all of us, and I will train f up more than 15,000 people and make them engage in these channels. I think one of the biggest mistakes today is that we are speaking about the social media department. Yeah, this are one department, and sometimes they report to the marketing uh, department, communication, PR, so to different areas. And I think we have to get into a world where we get a better and a more holistic approach. By the way, may I ask yourself, uh, please raise your hands if you feel that the organization of your social media uh, uh, IT, uh, uh, sorry, uh, infrastructure is in the right hand, so in the right organization. Could you raise your hand when you feel I'm in the right department and, and that the organization uh, really makes most sense of it? Okay. So, uh, can, can I make the opposite check? Could you raise a hand if you feel I'm not in the right department, that we are not leveraging that in the right way? Okay, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting view. Okay, thank Tom you. Hines, yeah? I have um, a question here. Yeah, please. Hi, thanks. I'm Thomas Reitstetter from Bauer Versand. Um, I got a, a question specific to Scott Galloway. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, thanks for your presentation this, uh, earlier this afternoon. It was great to, to you. hear your, your speech. Um, I, th I think I got most all of the points except for the third part of your presentation, which was about living 100 years. Uh, and there was just this, this um, thing I, I just didn't understand. First of all, I, I got three parts to that. You have a certain genetic predisposition to cancer or, or, or illness or something mm -hmm. that allows you to, to live um, for a certain no. amount of time. Then if you go down to the party tonight in Amsterdam, you shouldn't smoke your head off. Mm -hmm. That's the second thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I didn't that get the third one. There came this slide and that said social. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I just didn't understand the context and ask you to elaborate a little bit. Sure. Is it like I get an extra year for every brand that I like on Facebook or something? <laughs> I, I just didn't understand. For it. sure. Thank, <laughs> thanks for the question and thanks for the generous words. So according to the New England Journal of Medicine, when they took centenarians, there's 80,000 people over the age of 100 in the U.S. In 20 years, there's going to be 800,000. It's the fastest growing population is people over the age of 100. And they tried to figure out what it is about people who live to be 100 that's different than the rest of us, the majority of whom will not see our 100th birthday. And they found three primary things, and then a couple what I'll call meta factors that sort of seemed uh, common in all of them. And the three things were, in reverse order of importance, was your genetics. People tend to think that genetics is number one. Why? Because we're lazy and we like to think the die have been cast, right? We just like to think, oh, I'm going to live to this age because this is how long my grandparents live. It's actually the third most important thing. Number two is lifestyle. Don't smoke. Don't be fat or obese. And the, but the number one predictor of your ability to reach 100 years was how social you were. But there's some nuance to it. It's not going down and smoking. It's not how hard you party. It's not even how many people love you. It's how many people you love. And I like this. So if the metaphor for social media is that I bet Brian here has 50 times as many followers as people he follows. He won't live as long as someone who's not as popular as me, if I'm try but if I'm following more people than are following me. The greatest indicator of living a long life is how involved you are in other people's lives and how much love you spread to other people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. Women who have kids in their 40s are five times more likely to live to be 100 years old than women who do not have kids or have kids before the age of the 40. Why? Because there's a source code that's on in our brains that registers when we are adding value to society and sends out a hormone that gets rid of bad hormones and you live longer. <laughs> And the best way you can indicate that you are adding value to society is to exercise very vigorously because it fools the source code into thinking that you're hunting prey or building housing. It's to love other people, and the best way to love other people is to give birth and be involved in your kids' lives. 
And it's mental stimulation, the same way that they give Parkinson's sufferers access to crossword puzzles. Severe exercise, mental stimulation, and being involved in people's lives in an affectionate, real way, that is how you reach 100. I like that. Isn't that nice? <laughs> That's a great message. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Karl-Heinz, we have uh, one more question. Yeah, please. Hello, my name is Sebastian Bertling. I'm doing social media marketing for Mercedes-Benz Cars in Germany. Um, Brian, uh, I've got a question for you. You've shown us that slide where, like, the focus of the fans, like, on Facebook, where do they look first? And we've seen that the most attractive part of the Facebook page is, like, the news feed in the middle, and the ad space on the right side is like less attractive and we've all heard that General Motors cut their Facebook ad spending so could you maybe give us a little insight or your opinion about doing ads on Facebook? Yeah, actually th this is an important discussion to have because most companies, I I've studied advertisements not because I've been paid to but because I just I needed to answer this question. You know, I looked at General Motors specifically and I wrote about it for the Harvard Business Review. General Motors cut a ten million dollar ad spend but maintain a $30 million creative investment for earned media, which was creative strategies within Facebook. I studied both, and I got to tell you, I was not impressed by either. The ads were ads, mm -hmm. trying to sell something to you that actually was intangible, and I don't know that I even wanted it. You know, I don't know if I, it just didn't make me feel inspired like the way that Nike does mm -hmm. or the way that BMW or Lexus, where they sell you a lifestyle. Then I looked at the earned media component. It's not terribly engaging either. So I'd be really curious to audit that $30 million spend. You look at somebody like Ford, where they spend more on earned than they do on paid, but you feel like you're part of something. And even Scott Monty of Ford was really vocal in coming out against General Motors as that news was made. It's the only reason I actually wrote that article, because he sent me this brilliant statement. He's like, can you use this? I said, I better figure out how to use this. <laughs> the problem is, is that ads do work. I experimented with this, but people don't believe it. I experimented with this over the course of New Year's, where I just bought a whole bunch of ads for nothing specific, just to see what happens when you trigger keywords, imagery, and words. Mm -hmm. uh, not just words, but expressions. Knowing that you were going to associate those visuals and expressions with certain types of people, and I would auto-rotate those ads based on what was clicking and what was not clicking, and see what would work. At one point, the, the outcome, because I didn't have a product to sell, the outcome was just likes. But at one point, it was registering so many likes that Facebook shut the ad off because it thought it was spamming, that it was, that it was a robot. But in reality, the imagery was wonderful. People saw it off to the sides, like, hey, that, what is that? It took a different mindset. And that's the problem that a lot of us have when we approach advertising or marketing in general, is we bring what we know. When in reality, what we need to do is bring what we hope to achieve, and that what we hope to achieve needs to be meaningful to the people we're trying to reach. Man, that is so different. In fact, if you can figure that out, you'll live to be 100 years because you're starting to show empathy. You're starting to show love. You're starting to show affection. You're starting to show signs of emotion that we've been sort of lacking for a long time. And if anybody's seen, it's actually one of my favorite episodes of Mad Men where Draper talks about the Kodak carousel. And he says that you're not selling them technology, you're not selling a wheel, you're selling nostalgia, the emotions that, you know, he's almost crying as he's saying this because he's picturing the loss of his family as he's looking at these pictures while he's mm -hmm. pitching it. But everybody in that room felt it. They were probably going to go buy that carousel later that day because of how he sold it emotionally. And that's what those ads take to be engaging. Thanks, Ryan. Another question. No question, and I have another, the last question. So we have spoken the whole day about all these different ways. Data is getting more important. Is this the end of marketing as we know it? Um, what are people doing or what would you suggest what companies should do to get closer to the data to, to, 
to get a better understanding about the consumers, the potential prospect, the potential clients and customers. Uh, Michael, maybe I can ask you last time, what, what, what is the opinion uh, from, from, from Dell side? I think that's a really tough question, and uh, of course there's no recipe. I mean, the Dell, the re Dell recipe doesn't work for everybody else, so it's hard to say, but you know, for a company like Dell, I would say it's really, first of all, trust, and I think, I said it before, a, a serious note, you know, think that your employees you know, are your biggest asset. I think, you know, empower them, you know, put them in a position that they can be educated about it because at the end of the day, think about this, Dell has 110,000 employees and I think probably 20, 30,000 are really in contact with customers, you know. This, you're missing the biggest portion of your expert because you're hiding as deep as you can inside a company. But, of course, it's not fair to kind of carve them out and let them speak to customers. An engineer is not used to dialogue with a customer, so you need to train them. And you need to select them in that way. The selection criteria for hiring for Dell have changed, mm -hmm. even in categories like finance people, HR people, engineers, because they need to be able to dialogue. And I think it's that type of thing where the internal process then kind of you know, gets smarter and smarter and something happens. And like I said, I don't know what this something means in the future, but something happens where the formal organizational structures are enhanced by something which is more effective and certainly a much more intense dialogue happens with customers. Any recipe where you would say, okay, but this is an important ingredient, this is at least something you should do. I spoke today about the privacy and the service, which is kind of a catch-22 from my point of view, yeah? Because we have to all, all be aware when we speak about privacy as a service, uh, privacy and service, only if I know you, I can treat you in a very uh, um, personalized way. Uh, in the pub and mum stores, uh, 20, 25 years ago, there was no privacy issue. The privacy is invented with the internet, to be honest. Yeah? So, a, a, any suggestion from you guys? You, you talk with people about this uh, every day. If you, if you look at the Michael Dell example, the first thing that most people will say is, well, it's Michael Dell. He runs the company. Of course, we're going to do what he says. But I think there is a recipe in what Michael Dell brings to the table. He cared about customers. You know, if, if I'm not mistaken, the whole social media adventure began with someone who was very socially influential having a problem with Dell servers over a weekend and started tweeting about it and asking for help. And Michael Dell saw this. And Michael Dell phoned somebody at home on a weekend, and that problem was fixed. And later, he realized the power of that and started to make investments in learning more about customer experiences so that they could start to fix them in real time because he realized that if they could address negative sentiment that was expressed, they could switch it to positive. If they can decrease the amount of negative things people are saying about the brand and increase the number of positive things that people are saying about the brand, you start to increase all kinds of things, the simplest of which is net promoter score. But the recipe there was that Michael Dell cares about his customers so much that he spent his weekend investing, actually, from what I understand, many weekends, many trips to his house of trying to build new technologies to get this done. So what does that mean to you? You care. That's why you're here. So how do we get people around us to care? And that's where we need to spend our time. The thing that I have learned is that, unfortunately, as Scott said, a lot of people running the organizations today are boomers. And they have a whole different definition of what success looks like. The good news is a lot of them are dying because they don't love enough. <laughs> and so that's opening the door for a lot of new leaders. So, yeah, just a quick shout out. Tomorrow you have Martha Rogers speaking, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Martha was into this stuff before it was cool. Yeah. I remember 1995, and she just deserves huge props for this. I remember going to Electron one to one marketing, and it was before there were classes in this, before there were positions in social media. Yeah. But she was really a pioneer in this stuff. Uh, she, I mean, she's one of my, uh, inspired my, a lot of what I did professionally. In Me terms too. of privacy, yeah. And I know the laws are different here. I think privacy is vastly overrated as an issue. Yeah. Whenever I hear somebody complaining about privacy, they out themselves as being over the age of 40. <laughs> When's the last time you heard a 23-year-old complaining that you violated their privacy? There, there's a general compact we have with consumers outside of religion, sexual orientation, or politics. But outside of those three topics, the compact we have is the following. Violate my privacy, just add utility in return. I don't care if you know I'm outside of Macy's. 
push me something such that I go into Macy's and I get 10 or 20% off or some value add. Talk to a 23-year-old about, look at the stuff they're posting on Facebook. Facebook is a huge violation of privacy. I, I personally, I get introduced as, we get all introduced as experts. I'm on Facebook unwillingly. I would like to put a banner across the top of my Facebook page that says, there is a reason we have not stayed in touch. It is physically uncomfortable for me because I'm at an age in my life where I want to be rich and anonymous. Those are my goals. <laughs> but if you are in the world of marketing, you need to look at the data and you need to realize that the people who are going to control the spending the people who are going to control governments are comfortable with posting a tremendous amount of personal information about themselves online, as long as, one, you don't abuse it, and, two, you add utility. I, I think privacy, for me, is a vastly overrated issue fueled by a series of 50- and 60-year-old white guys in Washington and, Bru and in Brussels. Yeah, I, I will add that because I, uh, <laughs> I actually studied this uh, to see – if privacy was an issue. And I studied millions of conversations. And it turns out that those fueling concerns about privacy were the media, mm -hmm. not yeah. people themselves. And people who don't have a problem with privacy, as Scott said, is exactly right on. They will willingly give you personal information, but it, and they have expressed this, that it has to come for something in return. Yeah. But I will tell you this. They have also said that a Facebook like does not mean that you can extract data. Yeah. It is not an opt-in. They have explicitly yeah. said this. So you have to think yeah. about the ask and the embrace. Yeah. Make it a formal dance, and people will love you for it. Thank you. I think we are at the end here. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Scott, and the rest of the team. Uh, tomorrow, 8.30, we have a dedicated session regarding privacy and service and what the legal impact of this all is. Uh, thanks for being here in the audience. I'm pretty sure you all will be at the party, right? Of course. Okay, so uh, you all have the chance to maybe also ask some questions under four eyes when you meet these people tonight at the party. Thanks. It was great meeting you again. Thanks. And of course it's not